Okay, so good afternoon everybody and welcome to another webinar offering of Kasama Teachers Community. Okay, so part two of our STEM education webinar series on Marvelous Math Solving Real World Problems. So this webinar will introduce through case study examples how the Create Maths project in the United Kingdom implemented STEM or st uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics within the normal mathematics curriculum through hands-on, practical, problem-based learning using real employment sector contexts and problems for learning. The learning approaches adopted by the project will be outlined and illustrated through learning resource examples and video of classroom practice. This webinar will also introduce how students were introduced to the application of mathematics in different careers and the outcomes with regard the motivation of the students. So all participants in the webinar will be provided with exemplar teaching and learning resources. That's why we are very excited about this afternoon because we will be getting really real life examples to be able to solve real world problems. Now let's get to know our resource speaker. This is his second time is coming back for the part two of our STEM education webinar series. We have Dr. Mark Windale, a senior specialist at the Simeo STEM Ed Center. So let me just formally introduce him by reading his short bio profile. So Dr. Mark Windale is a senior specialist at the Simeo STEM Ed Center. Prior to that, he was a director of international science education and STEM programs at the Center for Science Education at Sheffield Hallam University. This is in the UK. So over the past 25 years, Dr. Mark's work has included running the national and international STEM education programs in different countries. He has also helped in the CPD of STEM teachers, STEM curriculum projects, development of STEM teaching and learning resources, CPD for school leaders in leading change, public engagement in STEM activities, and research. So as you can see and you can hear from me, you know, uh, Dr. Mark Wendel has been very busy and he's a well-respected figure in the field of STEM education. So Dr. Mark also led the National Science and STEM Education Projects in partnership with the British Council in different countries like Thailand, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, Vietnam, China, Sri Lanka, India, Kazakhstan, Ecuador, Azerbaijan, and UAE, among many, many others. So that's why we are very honored to have with us this afternoon Dr. Mark Wendell. So without further ado, uh, let's see and hear from Dr. Mark Wendell. We'd like to see you on the screen. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and, uh, and welcome to, to this afternoon's webinar. Um, I, I hope you can see the uh, the PowerPoint now, um, which I'm 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 using, um, and you will um, have copies of this available as as well as the um, resources I'm going to introduce you to um, this afternoon to exemplify the practices um, I, I'm going to to introduce. Um, I think it's first of all worth me um, just clarifying once again that we all know that, that STEM is science, technology, engineering, and maths. But my um, preferred definition of STEM and STEM education is, is the application of one or more STEM subjects to solve real world problems. And to me, this definition makes accessibility to STEM in our subjects, our individual subjects, more um, um, feasible and, and achievable, that we can engage our students in our maths classrooms in solving real world problems by applying their knowledge and understanding of mathematics. And I think that's that's really important. That's that's what makes it accessible to mathematics teachers. In the UK, we were introducing STEM to, incre to increase the motivation and achievement in STEM subjects of our students, to increase their participation, the numbers of underrepresented groups in STEM subjects, and to address real workforce needs. 
And what was interesting for me was that when I started working um, in the field of STEM and STEM education in, in Southeast Asia, that these were the same reasons for introducing STEM um, into um, our education systems in Southeast Asia, to, in to increase the number of underrepresented re um, um, unrepresented groups um, in, in, our, in our countries, and to address those very real workforce needs across the Southeast Asian region. So I think that was that was really interesting to me that those same reasons were were the same here in uh, in Southeast Asia. What I'm going to do this afternoon is I'm going to use a case study of a project which we developed in the UK as a joint project between my centre, the Centre for Science Education, and our colleagues in the Maths Education Centre at Sheffield Hallam University. And our colleagues were actually on the same um, floor in the same building um, um, at, at Sheffield Hallam University. And it's, I think it was a really innovative mathematics project, which ran over three years. It was a regional project. It was funded by the regional development agency, um, Yorkshire Forward, who had, who really wanted to make a difference in terms of STEM, um, with the aim of increasing the number of students going on to study STEM and to um, take up um, employment within the STEM sectors um, in um, the region of uh, Yorkshire and, and Humber, um, which was the, the region in which uh, we, were, we were based. And uh, I think this, this project was, was really aimed at helping to support their aims of increasing um, STEM take up um, and, uh, and, and workforce. Our, our aims really were to um, enhance the teaching of mathematics in Yorkshire and Humber through a concerted programme of continuing professional development, what we call CPD, um, and also to provide and support that through resources and events. And our objectives were to raise achievement and motivation in mathematics through the, the project. And the components that made up the project was central to it was continuing professional development. But that was supported by the development of learning resources to help teachers put into practice um, functional mathematics in their classrooms. Um, using real contexts for learning from, from the employment sectors within the, um, the region. It was also the, the events which were, were designed to motivate and enthuse students in mathematics. And all of this was sustainably supported by the resources developed by the, um, the project and that, um, that continuing professional development of the teachers. So as I've mentioned, what we were really trying to do was to support functional maths in, in work-related contexts. Functional maths had become something which was part of the, the new curriculum. It was something which teachers were, were introducing into their classrooms. And we were, we were supporting that through the Create Maths project. The project model um, had, had a number of, of components to it. The first very important thing was developing partnerships with local authorities in the region. And through those local authorities, identifying what 18 core schools. Half of those schools were what we might have called maybe low achieving schools who had the potential to improve. And, and I think that was really significant. Sometimes projects focus on the best schools, but this project really did focus on those schools that, that weren't performing 
particularly high at the time, but they had that, that potential to improve. Also, it involved continuing professional development for the core school mathematics teachers. And they were central in the writing and trialing of the resources, working with lead writers with whom they work closely in terms of developing ideas and giving feedback. That led to the development of a range of learning resources developed and to use contexts which are based on the 12 Yorkshire and Humber priority work and industry sectors. This was something that was really wanted by the, um, uh, the development agency by Yorkshire Forward. Also, of course, we worked with other teachers um, who were non-core school teachers from local authorities across the, the region, working with the local authorities to build the project and project resources into their normal professional development programs. And, and I think that was really important, was the development of the partnerships to enable that to happen. Also, partnerships with all the initial teacher education universities um, in the region so that the um, students who were going to become mathematics teachers were also introduced to the uh, project and the resources, most importantly. And as I mentioned, the final component was motivational activities for students in mathematics outside the classroom. The core school teachers were, um, were, were selected in each school. There were two teachers who worked together. Um, a key practitioner, or what you might call a master teacher, who worked with another colleague, a buddy. And the reason for having two teachers was, A, they could work together, they could action plan together, they could implement together, observe each other, reflect together, carry out action research together, support each other as they implemented in their classrooms. But also it was important to enable sustainability if one of the teachers moved on um, to another school, that there would be a, still a teacher remaining to work with other members of staff in the school. And these um, teachers were involved in the development of the resources. So once we'd introduced them to the, um, the approaches in terms of implementing functional mathematics in the, the classroom using real context for learning, they were then involved in the process of developing the, um, the learning resources. And what they did was they met with writers, editors, um, and brainstormed ideas related to the 12 different sectors and how that could be related to the curriculum that they were teaching at lower secondary level, what we call Key Stage 3 in the UK. The writers and teachers initially developed ideas and topics. The writers then worked on the, um, the ideas to bring the ideas back to the teachers. And the reason we use this approach was that um, the teachers were under a lot of pressure and we didn't want to increase that pressure by expecting them to develop all of the resources themselves. So the writers did, did that work and those were mainly um, staff from, from the university. They also, um, once they developed those ideas, the teachers were able to feed back into those ideas so that they could be further developed. So it was a sort of a cyclical development methodology of input from the teachers, further development from the writers, then further input from the teachers. So that ultimately there were resources which could be then trialed by the teachers in their classrooms with their students. And, um, and following that trialing, of course, the teachers and writers met again so that the teachers could give feedback on their experience of using the resources in their classrooms, things that work, things that didn't work quite so well, things that needed further development. And so 
the materials, the resources could be revised again and then ultimately then disseminated to their colleagues in their core schools and used in their classrooms. These sessions that the, the key um, practitioners were involved in um, at the university um, were, were held at weekends. So there was a, a real commitment from the key practitioners in terms of the development of the resources. And the, but of course, that was also involving their professional development as well. Um, and, and actually, we did um, to give give them um, 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 an honorarium to, to support their travel and time. And we called that a professional fee. And I think that the teachers really valued that, that, uh, that they, their, their um, input was valued and their time was valued by the project. And this led to the, as I mentioned, the development of resources, which really applied maths in, within each of the 12 employment sectors included activities which related to the industrial or work-related aspects of the sector context and focused on the development of the functional mathematics skills of the lower secondary stu students and it linked with real and, and, and significant mathematical thinking with authentic real world applications and problems. And I think this, this was the strength of the resources. This is what really motivated the students and the teachers um, um, when, they, when they used them. We covered, tw there were 12 topics, each topic covering one of the sectors, one of those 12 priority sectors. So the topics included growing food, working with chemicals, building for the future, making things work, health and social care, um, shopping around, which of course was looking at the retail sec sector and so on. Um, so we used um, a, a topic for each of the um, employment sectors, those priority sectors. And across those 12 topics, there were probably just over 60, 60 activities developed in total. And the topics were used probably two or three hours of curriculum time, with most activities um, covering a single lesson. In some cases, they might have been two, two um, um, lessons. Um, but what you can see from the example I'm showing on the screen now, which was about growing food, is that within that context, we developed a range of different activities which covered different aspects of mathematics. So it meant that the resources could be very flexible. So, for example, if a teacher was, um, was teaching geometry and, and uh, um, to the students, they might have used the first activity which was um, with under the topic of growing food, which was about building silos. And I'll talk more about that in, in, in just a moment. Or if they were introducing the com concepts of Latin and uh, Greco-Latin squares um, under the context of, um, of, of the um, growing on, uh, and of plants and the use of fertilizers in, in growing areas and carrying out experimental growing conditions um, for the growing of crops. This they, they might have been the context that they might have used to involve the students in systematic analysis and careful recording and proof. Um, when looking at the four types of wheat and the growing of four types of wheat. So, wheat. so thinking about rotation and reflection. Or if the teachers wanted to develop the skills of the students with regard to the um, data collection, recording, um, calculation of averages and, and range, introducing the idea of range in, in results, then they might have used the helicopter seas example. Or 
an example, I, again, I'm going to show you in a moment, if they wanted to develop students' um, um, skills and understanding of probability, developing probability models and simulation, um, um, then they might have used the, the rabbits example. So let, let's just look at two of those examples for that particular topic. The building silos was about making um, a model, making a scale model. And the idea was that students were making the scale model for an engineering company who were going to be building silos for farmers to store their grain. And this was going, this involves the students in um, scale and ratio, the volume of cylinders, measurement conversions, graphs, and substitution into formulae. So it's, again, the students are working at quite high levels. And the, re the reason that they're taken to those higher levels of thinking is that although they're using a specification for the silo, which has the specifications in terms of size, et cetera, of, of each of the components, et cetera, et cetera, the students will start off with a cylinder, which is going to be the core for the cylinder that they're developing, which might be the, um, might be the end of a bottle. Okay, so they might take a plastic bottle, which is their cylinder to start with, and of course, what they have to think about is the ratio of that to the size that's of, of uh, um, from the specification that they're being provided. So it, it really starts to get the students thinking about ratio. And, um, and the purpose here is for the students to build this, this scale model for the engineering firm so that they can use it um, to A, to show farmers, but B, in, in terms of the, the development of the, um, of the silos that they're building. And their think, the thinking of the students is taken even further. When the students are introduced to the idea, okay, well, actually, some of the farmers have a greater um, um, volume of grain and, uh, and, and some of them want it to have um, a bigger capacity. So they want it to be increased by 500, um, 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 uh, 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 <laughs> be able to hold 500 kilograms of, of wheat more than the um, example than you, that you've developed. So again, the students are now having to think further about the volume of the cylinder and apply their understanding of that. So the students, if you are teaching about cylinder, volume of cylinder, ratio, et cetera, et cetera, this would then help the teacher to involve the students in a real problem developing a scale model, which very often happens when engineering companies are developing um, and working on the development of um, uh, and ma manufacture of, uh, um, of the component parts and uh, ultimately the silos that they're building. Another example, as I mentioned, was the idea of rabbits. <laughs> which can cause real problems for, for, for farmers. A rabbit consumes about half a kilogram of, um, um, of grain per day. And, uh, of course, if there are large numbers of rabbits, this is going to affect the, um, um, the crops of, uh, of farmers. And so they need to be able to understand when this is most likely to happen. And so what the students are doing here is that they're looking at historical data to develop a probability model and then design a simulation to model the growth of the, um, of the um, rabbit populations to help the, the, the farmers to be able to predict 
when they could be losing most um, um, of their, um, you know, the crop that they're, they're growing. And, and this is a real problem. And so the students are helping the farmer to be able to um, address this problem and prepare for this problem in terms of developing their probability models and their, their simulation. So the students, as I've mentioned, are using um, historical data to develop their models, um, both in terms of the probability model and, and simulation, which will then help the farmers to, um, to predict when um, it, they're most likely to have problems um, from the, the rabbit populations. So again, another real problem, um, applying um, probability in this case. Another topic that, the that uh, um, was developed was this whole idea of childcare and early years. And again, a very flexible unit. So uh, it could be used for the teaching of um, measurement, scale, surface area, um, volume of sil si simple solids, um, and, uh, and algebraic substitution. Um, or it could be used for um, the development of students' um, ability to read complex graphical information, which is used in the world of, uh, of, of medicine. And with the students being, uh, having to look at real charts that are used professionally in medical um, careers, interpret the graphical information um, and develop logical arguments and justification based on their interpretations of that real um, 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 information. So again, using real context to develop the mathematical skills of the students. I'm not going to describe all because, of course, there isn't time, but I will provide you with the, uh, with the resources. So let's look at one of the examples, which is about um, keeping, keeping a baby, baby warm. And the context here is having to, uh, the students are going to help, have to help health visitors to be able to explain to mothers why it's important to keep their baby warm. Okay, and um, and and what and why it's so significant with babies com compared to them as as mothers, and so what the students are going to be involved in doing is making models, models of babies, and um, models of mothers, and of course these will generally be done to um, to scale so that they can compare the surface area to volume ratio of babies of different sizes and of course of um, adults uh, and the mother um, in, in, in this case. So the students are going to be looking at calculating the volume of, um, of different um, 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 shapes um, so they're going to be looking at cylinders, they're going to be looking at, um, at cubes and, and so on, depending on what they use to make, to, to create their models of a baby and so on. So it's, uh, it's again, it's, it's the mathematics that the students will be doing in their normal classrooms, but putting it in the context of a real problem, which is this surface area to to um, to volume ratio, which is so important in terms of um, losing heat from the body, and and so that they're using their models and their calculations to really be able to um, model and show and explain to mothers why it's so important to keep their babies warm to to wrap them up to keep them warm okay so um that's a another real example and i like this one in terms of you know um bringing to life this idea of of uh, volumes and surface areas of uh, um of different uh, shapes and uh, cubes and cylinders etc et, et another example another topic is building for the future 
um, where students might be developing their knowledge and understanding and skills of Pythagoras theorem, um, 3D shapes, visualization, um, etc., to solve problems with regard to the skills that architects um, apply every day in their workplace or um, developing the skills to um, manipulate transformations or you know translation reflection and uh, use the language of polygons etc in um, solving problems to do with construction and using construction materials such as bricks and tiles or Again, they might be developing their, underst their understanding and applying their understanding of uh, the properties of uh, um, quadrilaterals and types of triangle um, and measurement of length and angle um, within, again, the construction industry. But the whole idea of using braces to um, support structures um, in the construction industry. And that's an example that I want to introduce now. And it's an example which uh, of something that I, I, I used and uh, um, um, as, a, as a starting point for, um, for students um, applying it to solve a real problem. Here, the students are looking, first of all, at rigid structures and getting them to think about all the different rigid structures, structures which are around them. And, and so the students might be taking photographs or making drawings of rigid, rigid structures where they live in the towns or cities or even the countryside where they're, where they're living. And, um, and then um, drawing the shapes within those rigid structures. So now the students are thinking about the different shapes, whether they're about uh, um, 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 uh, triangles or quadrilaterals and so on. And so the students are, are starting to think about rigid structures through um, their, their observations and their drawings and getting them to think about what makes these structures rigid before they then go on to explore this further through the use of geostrips. Now these geostrips can easily be made using, using card and uh, split pins or, um, or using, you know, what we introduced you to last time, which was the, the use of uh, um, ice cream sticks um, and, uh, um, and, um, and, and split pins. Um, so here the students are starting to take their understanding of rigid structures further and introducing the idea and looking at the use of braces to, um, to strengthen rigid structures. And so they're carrying out different um, 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 tests here um, using different shapes um, of, uh, of structure and how they can support those different structures using braces, okay? And the number of braces that they might use. So the students are carrying out their own experiments here um, looking at different shapes, looking at different um, the uses of different numbers of braces and where and and putting those braces in different positions and looking at their effects before they then go on to look at this further um, in terms of being able to predict the effects of using braces in different positions now. The students might do this intuitively as they did in the, the previous experiments that they carried out. And what, uh, what's important here that when we're using this activity is that we also use, maybe throw in some examples of where they are in, you know, intuitive um, 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 examples which sort of throw the thinking of the students or extend and take their thinking to higher levels. 
And, and of course, what the students are going to be developing through this is an idea of, um, of angle and, uh, um, and the effects of angles, et cetera, um, in terms of the use of braces. I actually took this further and, and um, with the context of um, roller coaster ride. And so I got the students to um, apply what they'd learned about rigid structures and the use of bracing in the design and, and building of a prototype um, a roller coaster um, um, uh, um, um, uh, I, I said, uh, yeah, roller uh, ro roller coaster experience. Um, um, so, um, so I used a video in this case of a um, um, an engineer at the University of uh, of Manchester who is involved in in the design of roller coasters all over the world. And uh, um, Professor Roberts and uh, I was getting the students to design their roller coaster rides and uh, and structures. Um, um, for roller coasters, using uh, by by using this, um, another example is uh, is from the whole, the world of I suppose logistics, um, and and this is, is 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 really important. And so the students could be involved in thinking about how companies might save money in terms of you know road, road haulage companies saving money through the design of their um of their their lorries uh, the trucks that uh, they're they're using how they might be able to save on fuel <clears throat> by um by uh, adapting the um the aerodynamics of their trucks um and this is quite a um i think quite a challenging mathematical um um uh, problem solving activity for the students and I'm going to show you that in a moment because the students are involved in in, calc in, in calculations using spreadsheets using calculation uh, calculators they're doing conversions and uh, using percentage in the context of what is quite a complex multi-step problem which I'll, 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 t I'll show you in a minute so um, again this topic, enables mathematics teachers to use different contexts within that logistics context to develop different mathematical skills and to apply them to solve real problems. So let's look at the example which was um, about um, saving money for road haulage companies, which of course is very, very important. Not only is it saving money, but it's also helping to protect the environment by reducing the fuel consumption of the um, um, of the trucks. And so the students are first of all introduced to the idea of <clears throat> the fuel capacity, fuel consumption of trucks that have not had any aerodynamic features added to them and where they've had a simple um, aerodynamic feature added which is um, a, a cab roof deflector and how that can, can change the aerodynamics and therefore the um, the fuel consumption um, and um, of the um, of the truck and enable them to to travel further on the same um, with the same fuel. That then leads the students into the problem, which is presented to them in a form of a letter from um, Yorkie Trucks Limited. Um, who really are very serious about trying to save money and, of course, at the same time, um, their, um, the, the effects on the, on the environment. And what they're, th they're asking the students is what um, 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 could they do to their trucks in terms of the designs that they could, be, that they could use um, to reduce the... Um, the fuel consumption and therefore the the costs um, involved and and the students are um, going to be involved in um, calculating using spreadsheets as well as calculators to find um, savings and there are a range of different variables that they're introduced to here so first of all the students are going to be thinking about um, the um, 
the process that they're going to go through to carry out the calculations. Okay, in what order should they do the calculations to be able to find the answer for the company? And of course, they're provided with data related to the different types of reflector or different types of modification which could be used to, um, <clears throat> to reduce fuel con consumption and, um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and the costs of those. So the students are not only thinking about reducing costs, but they're also having to think about, well, how long will it take to recoup the investment in the in in the, these modifications to the um, to the trucks? And as you can see in the letter, the students are informed with regard to how many trucks they already have and what those you know the design of those trucks etc etc so it's quite a complex problem that the students are having to solve here but it's a real problem that logistics um, um, people are involved in in solving for um, the companies that they might be working for um, such as road, road haulage um, um, companies um, and actually a friend of mine's uh, wife was involved in actually doing this um, in her job um, <clears throat> and uh, so it was, really was a very, very real problem that she had to solve every day of her life. And, uh, and so the students are going to be involved in not only using, you know, calcul doing calculations, but also um, setting up and using spreadsheets to help solve this, this problem. I'm going to show you an example now of another problem that the students were involved in, uh, in, in solving. And this was, was um, um, a teacher, Daniel, um, who um, was one of the, the key practitioners involved in the project. And, and he's using one of the examples in his classroom where the students are going to be looking ultimately at, at how they can save um, um, the, um, um, or reduce costs for um, a cable, um, a TV cable company who are laying cables to um, to different um, villages and towns, and and how they can use the least amount of cable, and therefore um, um, look at the the least expenditure that they can have in terms of laying those cables. So I'm going to show you um, Daniel actually doing this in his classroom, and. Uh, uh, so um, please bear with me a moment while I, um, I just set this up for you. <clears throat> Here at Graham School, a specialist science and arts college in Scarborough, a class of year nine students is focusing on how mathematics is used in different careers. Throughout the day, they'll be taking part in a number of activities intended to show how the skills they use in the classroom relate to jobs in the real world. Morning. How many of you in here have got paper around? Put your hand up for me, please, if you've got paper around. To start off the lesson, teacher Daniel Gadd is asking some of the students to deliver newspapers <clears throat> to their classmates. Got some newspapers here and I've put four people's names on them. Matthew, will you deliver them for me, please? The students who are due to receive the papers are on opposite sides of the room, meaning Matthew will have to retrace his steps. However, the second student has a different approach to the task. Thank you very much. Sit yourself down. Tell me why you did that. Instead of going forward and back, you just do one per. You just do like that table and then that table. And what does that do? Why did Save you do time. that? Saves time. Saves time. Okay, excellent. I gave the papers out because I, I wanted to see how they think to start with. It's one of the one of the things. If I give them the papers, some people will sit there and work out what the route before they're going to do it. Some will just say, okay, um, I've got to give that to John. Can't give that one to Andy and do them in the order I gave them out. 
it's relevant. Some of the students in the class have paper rounds and actually have that, that thing to do in the morning or in the evening after school is to look at their round, where they're going to deliver papers to and, and make a decision on which order I'm going to do them in. Expanding on the exercise, Daniel gives the class a task on a larger scale. The problem I'm going to give you to start with, all right, is can you go down every single street, but only down each street once? You don't want to waste time on a paper round by going back down the same street a second time. I think we need to start around here, because that way you've got, so like I'm going to start from the top and go down to the bottom. The activity introduces the students to network diagrams and how mathematics can be used to aid efficiency. Oh, man, I needed to do just this two lines. They attacked the activity exactly how I thought they would, just by trying to yeah, starting somewhere and, and trying to do it and then start if I can't do it that way, start somewhere else. And once they've found one, it actually gets around the room fairly quickly. That if you start there, you can do it. The students have come up with a number of different solutions to the problem, but they all have something in common. Excellent. What do you notice about what we've just done? They all start and finish in the same place. Okay. We're, we started and finished on these two points. Now tell me what's happening there, Andy. There's three different directions that you can take. Okay, and we finished down here. What's special about that junction? There's three different directions that you can okay. take. Okay, now, did anyone find any other way of doing that route? That's because it's not possible. Okay, you must start and finish at one of those two points. There's two nodes or junctions where there are three streets coming into that diagram. And you must start at one and finish at the other because otherwise you can't visit all the streets. If you start at a junction on that diagram with an even number of nodes, the solution's not possible. This is a real world problem, which mathematics can be used to solve. So if I've got a, a diagram, or a network diagram of a route, I can tell just by looking at it where I need to start, where I need to finish. If it's possible to do that route without going down the same road twice, that might be important to supermarkets, haulage companies, people delivering things to people to save on petrol, to save time and to maximise, to make the most profit. Yet some haulage companies employ people called logistics managers to design their routes so that they are saving petrol, saving diesel, saving time. The aim was to try and provide some real life examples of problems that appear in the real world that involve maths to try and um, spark some life into maths, if you like, um, give them some idea of the sort of problems that are out there, the sort of careers that perhaps they hadn't even thought of existed, um, and the maths involved in those. Using motivational teaching and learning techniques like this one is a way to show students the subject in a more positive way and may encourage more of them to choose mathematical careers. The next problem is a cabling exercise in which the students have to plan how they can connect a number of towns with cable TV using the minimum amount of cable. This differs from the previous exercise as they don't need to join the points in a continuous loop. I'm going to put a cable along that road, I'm going to put a cable along that road, I'm going to put a cable along that road, and that road, up that road, up that road. They're all connected together now. now okay, so I could take that one out and put that one in, right? Okay. I'll put that one in then, just to take that one out, okay? Now, what is the shortest amount of cable that I can use? Are you with me? So I've just done that haphazard to show you what we've got to do. Is there a way you can work out how to connect them all together, but use as little cable as possible? While some students can easily work out the problem on paper, for some, it helps to use props, such as ropes, to figure out their solution. This gives them a concrete experience as opposed to an abstract one. Here, the students are modelling the cable laying exercise by using posters displaying the different town names and a long piece of rope to represent the cable. Okay, who has Westgate? Okay, you have the pen. 
And then one meter away, we need Grimsby. Okay. He holds that, and then you two come up here, and then that joins on to Westgate, and then if from Grimsby we need Wheelsby Road, which is four meters away, and then, and then it would be New Waltham here, and then it would go up to the golf club. Does it need to go back to the golf club? No, Why? because it's already connected. Because everything's already connected, isn't it? And then we've got them all together. Brilliant. The reason they're valuable exercises is that they're real-life problems. They're real-life things that um, someone out there has to do. Um, and that it shows them that, that the relevance of maths. It also gives them something to think about. So we're using thinking skills and communication and group work skills, which is again, something else that, that when they leave school, the sorts of skills they're gonna to need to, to be able to use to work effectively. As communication is an important part of work, the students practice this by presenting the results of the cabling exercise to the rest of their class. We tried to get rid of most of the bigger roads. Like we did the seven, uh, kilometre one we got rid of that and changed it with the farm kilometre one to use less petrol and less different distance. Can you tell me then why it's important that you would use the shortest length of cable to connect all these towns together? Um, so you're not wasting cable because it costs money. How are you saving money? By cutting how much cable you use so you don't have to buy as much, by not hiring as many men so you get the work uh, done quicker because you haven't got as long a distance to go. The aim of these exercises is to introduce the students to ways in which mathematics is used in different professions. This is taken further in the final activity. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop it there because I'm aware of the time. Um, you will have the the PowerPoint and the link, and so you will be able to watch how um, how Daniel then um, involved the students in looking in other at other careers and how mathematics is applied in those other careers. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those might, for example, be nurses. Um, and how nurses might be um, applying mathematics when they're ensuring that they're um, dispensing, A, the right drugs, but also the right concentration of the drug to, um, to the, uh, the different patients that they might have on their ward. And so here's an example where the students really are put in the role of a, of a real person, a nurse, having to um, dispense um, the drugs um, correctly to different um, different patients. And of course, what you can see here is that different pills have different strengths and, uh, um, uh, and different uh, patients need different doses. So it's quite a, an interesting problem for the students to solve, which is taken a little bit further in terms of um, dispensing um, different strengths of the of the drugs to um, different um, different patients, and then thinking about concentrations and uh, and getting students to think about um, the masses and the the volumes and uh, um, and 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 sorting cards into um, weights and volumes and identifying which ones match and which ones are odd 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 ones out so again using that context to help the students to um, to solve those 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 problems I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I think the key, one of the key aspects of the project was the relationship developed um, with the local authorities and the local authority maths advisors who, um, who involved um, some of the key practitioners from the, the project to introduce teachers in their authorities to the resources, the website, through hands-on experiences, enabling them to reflect on and discuss the implementation in their classrooms, and to really appreciate that idea that the Create Maths team really truly values the M in STEM, 
The M isn't a small M, it's very much a big M in the, the, um, the world of uh, employment in Yorkshire and how it's applied to solve real world problems um, within the 12 employment sectors in Yorkshire. The, as I mentioned, the, um, the team from the Mathematics Education Centre um, trained um, um, initial teacher education students in all the HE institutions in um, Yorkshire and Humber. There were student events which were are called away days for the students. When they went to venues, they were involved in maths magic activities run by um, um, initial teacher education students or by people at the venues or by the, the project team involving them in mathematics trails, fun motivational speakers who use mathematics in their everyday life, games and challenges. We also worked with um, um, educational um, uh, special needs teachers um, to, um, to enable the resources to be used with SEN students. And those teachers helped to develop two booklets which were used by T, um, SEN teachers and teacher assistants to be, you know, to really, you know, enrich um, the activities and context with with students in um, special edu uh, special schools or with SEN class classes um, within a mainstream or SEN students within um, normal classrooms. And those again were available, as with all the resources, on the project website. There was very much um, a, an effect on student attainment, which was commented on by teachers um, who were involved in the project. And, and this, of course, was one of the um, objectives of the project. And partly that was due to the motivation of the students, as you can see from the, the comments that the, the teachers were making. It also made a difference to the maths teams and the development of their schemes of work and the application of functional mathematics in their um, um, in their schools and that effect that it had on the attainment of the students and um, and so you can see that the students really did become highly motivated through the the events that they had and through the activities that they did at school the um, the project was um, independently evaluated by a number of different organisations um, that are listed here. The Special Schools and Academies Trust, the um, QCA, which is a Qualification and Curriculum Authority, um, which oversees assessment um, in, the, um, in England, um, the National Centre for Excellence in the Teaching of Mathematics, and also the National Strategy which had the role of raising attainment in mathematics across England. And what they did was that they used the, um, the approaches and used the resources on their training programs to disseminate across the country. So it then became more of a national project and not just a regional project. So I hope I've been able to introduce you to some of those key things which the, um, the Create Maths project was doing in terms of using real um, um, employment sector problems within their class, within normal mathematics classrooms to develop the normal mathematics skills, understanding of students who then applied those skills and understanding to solve those real problems. And I, I think it was a, a really highly motivating you know, project um, um, for students uh, within the region and, uh, and ultimately across the country. If you, if you want to contact me, you're welcome. Um, and so you can see my, my contact details there. I'm going to be sharing resources um, with the, um, 
the team and uh, so that uh, they'll go onto the website for you to um, be able to access those as well as uh, the PowerPoint I've used this afternoon and the example um, of the classroom of Daniel um, using the uh, resource in the classroom. So I think it's now time for me to answer your questions. I think I've talked for long enough. I do apologize that I've gone over time, um, but I'm prepared to stay as long as you wish to answer, um, answer your questions. Um, so that's what I will do now. I'll stop sharing and uh, <laughs> answer any questions which you have. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mark, for that wonderful presentation. We all marveled at the examples and the um, different resources that you, that you showed us. Okay, for our Q&A portion, may I call on Mr. Ramon Sanchez from UPNIS Med, who will be moderating our Q&A portion. Take it away, Sir Ramon. Uh, thank you for that, Ian. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon, Dr. Mark. Wow, that was a very interesting talk. It's a great talk. I like the examples you showed that are relatable. Okay, so uh, we will be uh, accepting questions for Dr. Mark, and please type in your questions in our chat box. We will try to address them as many, uh, as, many as possible. So we already have our first question from Melanie Obisunio. Congratulations to the teachers. Oh, yeah. Okay, congratulations to the teachers for the great lessons they developed. May I ask, how was the work arrangement of the teachers with their respective schools while working on this project? Okay, I, I think that's a good project. A uh, good question. The um, the teachers actually um, had their normal teaching timetable. Um, so depending on the level of the teacher, they might have been teaching 34 out of 40 lessons, 36 out of 40 lessons per week, and then they were working with the teams uh, of writers and and editors at weekends in terms of developing the learning resources um, so um, um, and then once of course the learning resources were developed they were uh, they trialed in their classrooms in their normal classes in normal time and uh, and also then ultimately um, trained their colleagues through um, departmental team meetings um, which would normally be held after school um, so um, so so the teachers did have additional work that they had to do as a result of being involved in the project but um, but obviously they were getting quite substantial professional development and I, as I did mention we did actually give them um, an honorarium for the time that they spent at the weekends which we called um, a professional fee um, which I think really you know made the, the te help the teachers think you know I'm really being valued and I'm and, and valued as a professional and and that was really important that we didn't want to overload them by help by making them spend lots more time writing the resources mm -hmm. They worked with the team at the university um, um, to develop the resources and the team at the university put in the extra time to develop the resources based on the advice that the teachers gave. And, uh, and so it was, as I mentioned, it was that sort of cyclical um, methodology that uh, went through in terms of developing the resources. But that, that was done at the, weekend with the, at the weekend meetings with the teachers. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I guess uh, teachers really don't do this one on their own. They always work no. in teams. In, That's right. right. So, mm. okay, so let's move on to our next question from Jarek Ray One. How do you develop mm -hmm. assessment criteria for the different activities? Okay, the, the cr assessment criteria that the, the teachers um, will be using are those ex, um, assessment criteria which are laid down in the national curriculum mm -hmm. um, that the teachers are following. And also um, in the criteria which are being used by the examination boards that they might be using um, um, for, for the students if it's, uh, if it's above key stage three. So, um, so we did actually run another, uh, an extension of the project for um, 
um, student, upper secondary students as well as as well as those lower secondary students. Um, so they use the the criteria which are ex they're expected to use as mathematics teachers. So um, so the the tasks that the students are involved in, those rich tasks that the students are involved in, are being assessed by the teachers using those assessment criteria laid down in the national curriculum. Okay. Mm, okay. So, so I guess yeah. the 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 curriculum that was set at the national level really had a big part in the in setting the criteria for assessments for this project. It did. Okay. It did. And and also the um, the, the teachers were, in, were were also introduced to a new part of the curriculum, which was functional mathematics, and that mm -hmm. had those that had criteria as well. So the teachers were using those criteria to assess the students in these um, activities as well. So it wasn't just the criteria which might be related to content, but mm -hmm. also criteria related to um, functional mathematics, which became a, a key part of the curriculum. Okay, thank yeah. you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. We will have our next question from Manolita Ramos Oligo. What would be the role of teachers? Uh, what would the role of teachers to employ hands-on learning activities in order to help bridge the gap between abstract and usable numeracy? I think you, you will see that all of the activities involved some form of, of hands-on activity, so which was helping the students to turn that abstract concept, which might be the, um, the calculation of the volume of a cylinder, into a real hands-on experience where they're making the, um, the silo and, of course, having to think about the volume of the silo for the grain that the um, the farmers need or think or it might be in the context of the the baby and calculating mm -hmm. the surface area of the cylinder or the volume of the cylinder so the students were making models in another another um, example where the students were looking at uh, um, the world of, of chemicals in uh, because which is the chemical industries in the Yorkshire and Humber region are quite big and so students were again looking at shapes of crystals for example and and of course that was related again to to the curriculum that the students were following so again they're making these and getting hands-on experience you saw how Daniel did it you know that hands-on experience of thinking of, of applying networks in their um, mathematical networks, in their um, um, in, in in solving real problems, so I think that that's really important. That all of the examples were not um, abstract; they 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 became practical, hands-on, um, so that the students were developing and applying their knowledge and understanding to solve those real problems through hands-on activities mm, okay that's good uh let's go to the question of richie noveloso uh well it's related to the to the yeah. second question how do we develop mm. authentic performance tasks in mathematics mm. yeah yeah well again what the teachers have are the assessment rubrics for um mm -hmm. or assessment indicators for um, functional mathematics and for the uh, the content of mathematics that they might be um, teaching, whether it's to be to, to do with geometry or whether it's uh, to do with um, um, looking at uh, Pythagoras theorem and, and and so on. So so the teachers have those assessment criteria, which are part of the curriculum. In the UK, teachers are expected to be a or, or parents can walk into a school any day and ask to see their teacher, uh, their, their child's teacher, and, and be able to ask, well, where is my, my son or daughter in terms of level of achievement? And so the teacher must be able to say, well, actually, your, your son or daughter is level five and is mm -hmm. level five because, and they can show them the evidence. 
and that evidence is based on the assessment of the students using those assessment criteria. And those assessment criteria are not just used to assess the students, they're also used to targets, um, 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 set targets for students in terms of their further development. And those are done jointly between the student and the teacher. So students set targets and the teacher works with them to set their targets. And it's based on their assessment. So if they're at level three, then the teacher will be working with the students to help them to get to level four. And the students will understand what it is they need to do to be able to achieve, achieve level four. And the teacher will be saying, well, next time we're gonna be doing such and such an activity. And if you're able to show evidence of, being, of, of doing that and achieving that, then you will have reached level four. You know? so, um, so this is something that, that teachers are constantly doing with students. They really do very practically put into practice assessment for learning in schools in the UK. It is a requirement, okay, of teachers. So my teacher, te my, my sister teaches English um, in a school in, uh, in England and she, she is constantly, when she's marking books, she's identifying the level of achievement. She then shares that with a student. She'll have a sheet that she completes when she's doing that, so which explains to the student what they've achieved, how they've achieved it, and what they need to do next to achieve the next level. Okay, so you know they 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 have to do that as a as a as, as a matter of course, because now of course teachers are are uh, that that's being used for example as key stage three mm. at lower secondary. It's teacher assessment which is being used now in terms of progression, not the not the SATs that we used to have, which were the examinations that students sat at age fourteen. So it's teacher assessment, and of course that teacher assessment has to be um, um, moderated, as I talked about last week, and it has to be obviously um, um, ensured that it's uh, at the it's it's been. Um, applied in, in at, at the expect in the expected way at the, um, um, by by teachers. So it's very important that that teachers do that. Yeah. Yes, I think that would be a challenge, a great challenge for us. We need to here in the Philippines. We need to define what is in each level, and uh, I guess mm. the second challenge would be mm. teachers need to know their individual students' performance. Yes. Right. Thank you for yes. that, sir. Uh, we'll yes. go to our next question from J.R. Agustin. How do we implement the activities on an online class setup? Are there any substitute for activities discussed? Okay, I think, I think that's a good question. And again, what you can see is that the activity that the students are doing could be done in any environment. Yeah, that um, even though they might be doing hands-on things, those are things that they have at home or in their you know mm -hmm. in their environment mm -hmm. in which they live in the community in which they live so they'll have string they'll have paper they'll have um card they'll have um maybe um um oh uh ice cream sticks you know etc so they'll have those things available um so that they can use them um at home and still get a hands-on problem-based um, application-based um, functional mathematics experience at home as well as as well as at school and of course again as I mentioned last week something which is important is that you as a teacher will be um, um, involved in, um, in in facilitating that online you won't just give them the activities um, <laughs> And, and expect them just to do them individually. You will give them to the students so that they, so you can facilitate them online. You can be mm. asking questions about, so what, what did you observe there? What happened there? What did you measure? How did you calculate this? Why did you calculate it that way? Yeah, so you can, you know, you can be facilitating the students as they're involved. The students can be working in groups online, either in, in rooms, separate rooms in groups, or they can be using their phones to work together online to, to solve these problems 
collaboratively. Um, some of activities might be done individually, some might be done in pairs, some might be done in groups. I think the key to working effectively online is putting into practice the good practices that we put into practice when we're teaching face to face. And I think what we've had to do over the past year and more is to look at how we do that effectively. So, um, for example, you might give the students an activity to do and then then you might have a session where online where the students are sharing what they did, sharing the results, sharing the outcomes, um, sharing their solutions to the problem. And, uh, and, and, and that gives you an opportunity to identify any challenges that they've had, maybe um, summarize what they've learned, maybe sensitively um, correct any misconceptions that they, they may have had. So what you can do working online um, is make an input, introduce an activity, the students do the activity offline, or, or by you know through telephone or in or even online in work work in in group um, um, rooms then they come back and they share what they've done okay so again it's about you going into those rooms or you engaging with with students asking questions to facilitate the learning okay too often i've seen bad practice which is just about giving information, just about giving activities to students to do, and not supporting, not facilitating, not asking questions. Um, you know, when, when people start, first started using um, e-learning or online learning, it was, it was very didactic, it was very knowledge driven. And so students involved in that type of learning were working at a low level of uh, a low cognitive level because they were just getting knowledge maybe okay mm. they weren't developing understanding yeah google is great but google doesn't develop understanding understanding comes from questions a the answering of questions the discussion of questions the sharing of answers the um um, and the debriefing of, of those, those discussions and those answers by the teacher. So I think it's really important that those good practices we do online as well as face to face. It does take more time, okay? Yes. I accept that, it takes more time. But then of course what we have to do is to um, um, is, is to organize the time more effectively. So the students will be doing tasks which are offline. They'll then be coming back online. They'll, we'll then, they'll be presenting what they've, you know, the outcomes, they'll be sharing and, and you know, etc. And then you will be deep, you know, challenging the students further through questions. You will be um, answering any questions that they have. You'll be debriefing effectively and i think that's really important yes uh yeah the the importance of questions in uh, facilitating the learning of the students that would be great um yeah. uh, time check it's 4 26 we are down to our last two questions or perhaps last question from anton reloj thank you very much for the presentation dr mark i would like to ask were there any topics wherein the teachers and writers encountered great difficulty incorporating into the framework or were you even unable to due to their real life applications being considerably beyond the experience and other prior or simultaneous knowledge that the learners have or are learning about? If yes, how were those topics addressed? Okay. Well, again, of course, you won't be doing topics with students which are um, which are not appropriate. So, you know, obviously, when you're thinking about this, you think about what you're teaching first. Then you think mm -hmm. about where is this applied within these areas, these 12 areas, as it was in our case in um, uh, areas of work um, in, in Yorkshire. So you always think about what is it we're teaching? Where will this that we're teaching be used 
to solve real problems in the real world. Okay? So you always start with your curriculum. And, you always, and of course that curriculum is designed for the students that you're teaching. However, you may find that it's not appropriate for the students that you're teaching and you have to adapt it. But then once you've adapted it, you then think, right, for this that I'm going to be involved in teaching, where is it applied? Yeah, and, and what problems is it used to solve where it's applied? Okay, um, so it's always curriculum first, yeah, what is it we're teaching, where is it applied to solve real problems within these different sectors, yeah. okay? So it means that you won't ever be doing something which is inappropriate for the students because you always start with what you're doing with the students, which should be appropriate for the students. <laughs> Yes. Uh, again, the, uh, the the importance of the curriculum is highlighted in, the, in your uh, mm. question, and also the importance mm. of how to adapt the curriculum with uh, the capabilities of the students. So mm. we have one last question. Yeah. That would be yes from Jerry Gray one. It was clear that students are being assessed on their level of understanding and or comprehension. There is no general established tool for that here. So how do we create one in our school level? And thank you very much okay. for answering in advance. Yeah, I, I think I think that's you know there's what I always do is if you don't have it, then look at what other people are doing, okay. And so if um, if you don't have these methods of assessment or these assessment criteria, then go and look at you know what assessment criteria are being used in the UK to assess this. So so look at the curriculum and look at the schemes of work which are available. Um, uh, on the, um, the Department for Education website in the UK um, or you could go to um, the, um, um, the, the National Centre for Excellence in, in the teaching of, 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 of mathematics and look at there uh, to see, to look at the, you know, what's, what they have on the, the website or you could look at other countries and look at what criteria they're using to to carry out these assessments. So, so don't think you have to start with a blank sheet of paper. Have a look at what other people are doing and adapt it to your situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, your curriculum. Don't think that you know that you have to reinvent the wheel. The wheel has already been invented by somebody, and so. It's how can we look at what other people are doing, use what other people are doing, adapt what p other people are doing, improve what other people are doing. Okay? Mm, yes, I totally <laughs> agree. We don't have to start with a mm. blank sheet. We can no. modify or adapt from what was yeah. already uh, used. Mm. So that would be yeah. the end of our question and answer portion. Thank you very much for everyone who who <laughs> shared their uh, who who presented their questions and uh, we greatly appreciated them. Sorry, thank Ian? you all. Yeah. Thank uh, you thank all you. For, for, for attending and, and thank you for, you know, for listening to me. I, I, <laughs> I don't like this environment. I, I much prefer to be face to face, seeing people. Um, I, you know, I think it's my age, but of course we've all had to adapt um, you know, to to the situation. So thank you all. I hope it's been useful. I will be sharing the resources. I will be sharing things I've I've um, I've used this afternoon with you and making those accessible to you. Okay. And so I hope they might help um, in developments in your classrooms for your curriculum and your context in the, in the Philippines or wherever, wherever else you may be um, 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 working, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. I think that's actually a key thing. We must make things work for us in our classrooms, in our context. So we must be thinking about how can I make this work for me and for my students where I'm working? Okay, and uh, and I, I think that's really important, um, and and of course, I'm sure I, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to say any more, Ian. I, I'm going <laughs> to pass it over to you now. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mark Wendell.
of course, on behalf of Kasama Teachers Community, we are very grateful and we learned so much from you in the past two weeks that we were with you um, with our STEM education webinar series. Now, Kasama Teachers, we have a series takeaway question that Dr. Mark Windel has shared with us. So please answer this. We are very excited to hear your answers to this question. In what ways can problem-based learning be adapted to your own practice and context as a science and or mathematics teacher? Okay, so we've reached the end of our webinar, the end of the part two of our STEM education webinar series. This is Marvelous Maths, Solving Real World Problems with Dr. Mark Wendell. And I have been uh, very privileged to, to host this two-part uh, webinar series of our STEM education webinar series. This is Ian Rubino of the Gokongwe Brothers Foundation signing off. And thank you very much for tuning in and for always being part of our webinar offerings of Kasama Teachers Community.